Welcome to a Friday Reads where I talk about what I read, what I'm reading, what I hope to get to next, some books that I've acquired, and I think I might ramble a bit in this one. So we're just going to jump into it. And starting with the book I finished most recently was The Bone Orchard. And this was way better than how I felt about it last week, but it's still just a four star read. The second half of this book is substantially stronger <laughs> than the first half of this book. I think part of that is that the character does acquire more agency. There are more connections that are happening, more interactions. The mystery is kind of interesting and in, like what's happening in this world, especially as this world opens up. I really like what it's doing. It's not the most entertaining thing I've ever consumed and it's not a perfect book but I also don't see many books that do what this one does. So like, it's one of those things where I keep thinking about it and I'm like, it's not a personal favorite. It's not a perfect book. I have actual issues with the pacing at the start of this and my issues connecting with characters, but I low key want to nominate it for awards because it's so unique and doing compelling things. Um, so following this main character and how she deals with her trauma by creating these bone ghosts and like what is happening in this land and how this land deals with people who have these magical abilities that really do have a drawback. And then the political situation as it unfolds. There's just, I think, some really nice character arc moments in this story. There were moments at the end where I felt some real good catharsis for our main character. And I was just like, this was good. So definitely glad I stuck through it. Glad I saw the reviews that were like, had the big turnaround, like Bethany from Beautifully Bookish Bethany, I think was one of the reviews where like, she almost DNF'd it at the beginning and then it became like a four and a half star read for her. And I'm not quite there on loving it that much, but I definitely really appreciate it now. The other one that I finished, which surprising no one I really liked is Alloy of Law. I have a live show discussion with a bunch of people. I will link that down below. This was fun. This is a fun time. It's a fun, campy, non-serious time in a world I love exploring. Yeah, this it's, it's unsurprising that I still love this book. And I actually finished it while on a train. And a lot of this plot happens because of trains and heists. Also, like, I was traveling to New York City. And this book kind of takes place in this world's version of, like, early days New York City, which was also interesting. So I enjoyed that as well. And yeah, it's just... It's just fun. It's also really interesting rereading this with the context of what is to come. That's always one of my favorite parts of rereading. Another one I finished, which didn't work as well for me, was this SFF magazine. And I think it's ETA. I think that's how you say it. Um, it's just that this, I think, was focused on a lot of speculative food fiction, which just, I think, doesn't really work for me most of the time anyways. Um, a lot of times when I'm reading about food, I'm not as into it as other people. And these were purposefully meant to be speculative food related stories to family. And I think it's a solid three stars. Like I didn't dislike any of these stories, but I also wasn't like enthralled by any of them. None of them stick in my head. I couldn't even tell you right now after finishing it, what, two days ago, any of the stories. Like it just all left my head the minute after I read it. But I'm looking forward to seeing more issues from this magazine in the future, just because I love the idea of getting to read translated speculative fiction. Like that's amazing to me, especially from South America. So I haven't given up on this and I might look at their earlier issues because they have two issues before this one. But this one, I just think because of its thematic cohesion and maybe also because of some of the translations, it was rough for me. Like I remember in two or three of the stories, I had to reread sentences because the prose just felt wonky in my head. And I don't know if that's just a case of Angela didn't work well with this type of prose, which happens even just in English, or if it was a translation thing, because there would be times where I'm like confused by comma placements and things like that when I was trying to read it in my head. But still want to check out this magazine. I've also been having fun with other magazines is one I'm, I'll talk about in the currently reading section. But the last thing I finished is this short story collection, Maria Maria, which is so good and like no one's gonna read it, <laughs> but it's such a good time. Um, like the short stories themselves, I think are really serviceable and good, like three and a half to four star stories all around. I think one story is maybe a four and a half for me, but the novella, the titular novella is phenomenal. I loved it. I loved everything it was doing. It was great. <laughs> I, I'm definitely gonna probably nominate it for a Hugo or something. It's just, this is an indie press book. I, it's not at your bookstores. I don't even, you know, think people look for short story collections ever. And this is a debut short story collection. But I, her writing was just so pleasant to read. And I love that it was a focus on brujas and Latina culture, specifically, I think California, that region is going to get more page time here because that's where the author's from. And it was great. And I actually like I read the flap of the book after finishing it. And 
it really links all the stories together in a great way. There's just a lot of thinking about your ancestors, um, relationship to land and other creatures, the spirituality of creatures. Like, there's so many things in the story. It has sci-fi, it has fantasy, it sometimes just has contemporary. I enjoyed it. I'm really glad Evie just sent this to me. <laughs> and then we read it together. I haven't heard her thoughts on the novella yet, but I think the novella... I mean, it's like half this, half of this book is the novella and it's great. I can't wait to reread it. It just had a lot going for it, especially because I just really like the prose style of this author, just like how she writes. Also, don't be scared by the skeleton. This is not horror. Like it has speculative elements and there's definitely some like resurrection tropes or, you know, day of the dead moments and things like that. But it's not like, this is not a horror novella or anything like that. All right, I need to talk about another DNF, which I know, one month, two DNFs, who is she? <laughs> I DNF the Plague Burst. This isn't bad. I just, like, noticed I didn't care. <laughs> I got 33% of the way through. The writing was fine. The sci-fi fantasy ideas were interesting. But I really wasn't believing the banter between the characters on the page. Like, none of it felt alive to me, and I didn't have any personal urgency with the story. And I was thinking, you know, you've had all this time to read, because I had actually a fair bit of time to read on the train and last weekend, and I just kept not picking it up. And, you know, in a month where I've had so many hits and so many books that make me want to read them, it's a DNF. <laughs> like, it's moving on. There's, like, perspective there, right? Like, when I've read so many four and a half and five star books that, like, made me want to read, I can just tell extra right now when something is hard for me to push through. So I put that aside, and I did decide to pick up my reread of The Jasmine Throne, which is phenomenal. This book's great. Oh my gosh, I think I'm loving it even more than my first time through, which I have a standalone review for this, I'm pretty sure. Oh, it's everything I want when you want rebellion and resistance and fantasy. I also love the ominous thing of this kind of like plague that's on the land, the politics. Priya is phenomenal. I love Priya. Anyone who doesn't like Priya is wrong. Priya is amazing. I love her. I love how messy Malini is. That's her. Oh, I can't wait can't wait to finish this and get on to the sequel and especially because all my friends who've read the sequel have loved it who have also loved this so I just like I'm, I'm just excited this is just so good and her writing is so it's, it's great it's so great <laughs> like the minute I pick this up I'm like oh yeah I just want to be reading this this is great because I was in a reading mood I just wasn't in the mood for the book I was reading a book that I'm not convinced I'll finish yet because again we are embracing the DNF right now is um, A Taste of Iron and Gold. Here's the cover. I currently don't have the dust jacket on it, but I do love Under the Dust Jacket. I think it is stunning. Like the, the purple, like it's a very pretty edition and it's not a bad book. Um, it's just, I've read three chapters and I'm only a hundred pages in. So the chapters are long. Yeah, I'm on chapter four and I'm on page a hundred. So that's kind of then weird with the momentum. And I think I'm past the setup phase of this fantasy romance. And hopefully the pace will pick up after that. Um, and I think these characters are really well realized. So it's not an issue with characters. And I don't think there's too much plot because it's like a political fantasy romance. And we all know that for some reason I keep trying this even though like it rarely works. <laughs> but one of our main characters has extreme anxiety. Um, and in this fantasy world, they don't really have a word for that. And he doesn't, I think like a lot of people who get anxiety feels like it's his fault. Um, so we have to deal with him. And when you're in his thoughts, it's kind of a lot. Like, I think it could be triggering to people with anxiety, potentially. Like, I think it's actually a very accurate depiction of how anxiety can feel inside your head <laughs> when it happens. And then the love interest, I, he's, he's kind of very by the book, very strict, super judgmental person when people don't meet his standards. And he's the guard. So it's supposed to be like a guard, is it a bodyguard romance? I don't know the trope, but that's what it's supposed to be. They're supposed to end up together. And right now, I'm just, I don't love either of them as people. I don't think they're bad people. I just, like, I'm not rooting for either of them. And I'm waiting for their connection to, like, make me root for the romance. So I think I'm going to give it, like, half the book. And if I'm not invested in the romance by then, I'm going to put it down because that's, like, the whole point of a romance book. <laughs> and that's, like, a super subjective thing. Like, I know Bethany really liked it and things like that. And, like, I do think there's a potential for some really good growth and healing in this story. I'm just not as in love with it. And the long chapters are just like, I mean, I can read a long chapter, but this makes Robin Hobb look brief. <laughs> like, I'm just like, what is this? Why are these so long? And like I said, I mean, Bethany told me that the politics of it are really like 
in the background and it's really not that deep and you kind of can figure out what's happening pretty quick and I'm, I feel like I'm seeing little tidbits of that and the world is pretty interesting it's definitely an LGBTQ friendly world and everything like that it's, it's really fascinating how the lines work and nobility and child rearing and stuff like that like it's an interesting world um, it's just that like I, I came to this for the fantasy romance part because I was looking for something that would engage me and so far that part of it has not gripped me and there's not been nothing else to take its place. But the politics is not supposed to be a big thing so I'm hoping now that we've set everything up we understand why these people are in this situation, we understand why our dynamic is starting here, it will go. That's what I'm hoping. That That's, that's what I'm hoping. I have also... I guess I should have talked about this in the finished, but it just like felt weird. I listened to a novelette because if you don't know, some speculative fiction magazines have podcasts where you can just listen to the short stories. And I'm like, you know, I'm about to be in a long car ride. I might as, because I don't think long novels work for me in cars. I try and I can never pay attention, but like hour to two hour short stories, novellas, novelettes, I think that would be great to dip in and out of. So I'm going to try it out. So I listened to the Uncanny podcast and they had this story Oh, I forget the name. It's a really long one. But I think it's If God Talks to You, Address Him in the Personal You, something like that. And it was a wonderful superhero novelette. It was really touching and engaging. And I loved the narrator. And like, like you follow the perspective of this guy at a gym. And he lifts four times a week. So he's, you know, a gym rat. And he's also always auditioning for musical theater auditions. So that's our, that's our main character. He's Asian. And at the time he's at the gym, he's contemplating or thinking about the fact that there's these videos going viral that have to be fake of this essentially Asian Superman figure. Um, and suddenly this really buff guy at the gym asks to lift with him and he starts to have ideas. Are you the super, you know, hero person? And it's, it's really interesting. It has commentary on how people react to the superhero, how the superhero engages and helps or interacts with activism. It's also just this friendship between these two individuals at the gym. Like, I really liked it. <laughs> I need to look into more by this author because I was so invested in these two characters for like an hour of my life. And if there are long form fiction for me to be that invested in, and that's how I found T.K. and Fisher. So nor this is why I love reading short form because it's how I find new authors. So I'm gonna continue listening to Uncanny and Clark's World because those are the ones I have found on podcasts that are easily accessible to me. And so that's just a way I want to keep consuming short fiction from a variety of authors because I want to be able to nominate some really good stuff for the Hugos. And I was just kind of feeling it. <laughs> and I'm really glad because the first one I listened to was just like A+. Plus. Now into the book haul. This first one I didn't get in New York, but it's no surprise that I have it. And that's the only end of sword. Ah, uh, can't wait, can't wait. I just have it. And I actually can't tell if it's longer or short. I think it's shorter than Jasmine Throne, because I think Jasmine Throne is greater than 500 and this is less than 500. And I feel like it's rare that the second book is shorter than the first book, but Tasha Suri, I feel like I can trust her pacing. I really didn't feel like there was wasted space in the Jasmine Throne, so just hoping this is a really nice, tight, engaging, but not too short time, because like I just love these characters so much. <laughs> so yeah, this is a goal for me to finish by the end of the month. Um, who knows if it'll happen, because, you know, the end of the month is approaching, I'm about to go home, how much reading will I get done? I don't know. Um, but this is definitely on the list. So this and Jasmine Throne and A Taste of Golden Eye are probably the rest of what I'm getting done for the rest of the month, which I'm fine with. If I'm, if I'm feeling it, I could read a novella. And I think my novella could be for my bingo board, because this is where the bingo board is. And if you can't tell, a sequel would be Oleander Sword, and I'm missing novella. And I feel like this is a novella. This, this feels, this feels pretty novella length. It's like 170 pages and it's huge margins. So this, 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 this feels like a novella. So that could happen. I'm not holding my breath, but it's fine if I don't get to it because I've had a great month of reading all the new releases and I've pivoted when I need to. Are there things that were on my TBR that I didn't get to? Yes, but you gotta let it go. And now I have my little book haul from New York. So I was in New York and our first day we just had like an evening and I was just like, well, I hear you're supposed to go to the Strand at Union Square. So we went and <laughs> my mom thought it was so cute that they had the blind date with a book thing that they had at the store. And I know internally that when that happens, it's usually like remainder books or books that like they have too many copies of. They're not always the best books. Sometimes they are. And so we picked two that were obviously romances. And I don't know if I'll end up liking this one, but the one I got was The Ruthless Lady's Guide to Wizardry. I have only seen okay reviews for it, 
but maybe I'll like the romance because I think that's the thing is if you like the romance of a romance book it's a winner and I just know some of my friends thought the beginning was great and then it lost steam because I think Bethany DNF'd this and I think Josh gave it three stars so I don't know where I'll land and if I end up you know giving it to the used bookstore that's not the end of the world either the point was it made my mom happy for us to both get books that were wrapped up with pretty art on them and unwrap them because it was her birthday weekend so but then we went to an indie press um uh, flea market at the Brooklyn Library, which was a blast. A, I got to go to Brooklyn, which I've never gotten to go to Brooklyn. And what, because when I go to New York City, I just go see musicals because I'm like, I, I, I was a drama club kid. I love musicals. So when I get to go, I save up money and I go see shows. And then I just spend all my time in Manhattan because that's where the shows are. <laughs> but we got to go to Brooklyn, to the Brooklyn Library, which is stunning, by the way. And I picked up these books from the Indie Book Fest because support indie presses, right? And they were books that all interested me. So this one sounds really interesting. It's 634 Ways to Kill Fidel. And I think it's written from or interviewed someone who used to be part of um, Fidel Castro's security force. And it's someone who witnessed all the ways that people tried to assassinate Fidel Castro, which sounds like a fascinating premise for a nonfiction. So I got this. Also, I really like this cover. I liked a lot of, they had a lot of nonfiction with this type of cover. And this is the publisher that does the fancy editions of Octavia Butler. I say that because I also got this short story collection, Blood Childs, by Octavia Butler. And I just, they did say they were going to have a hardcover coming out soon, but this just looked so pretty and I needed it. I only have to read this fledgling and then the two, like the undiscovered stories or something that were like not ever actually officially published by Butler. And then I will read every word that the public eye has ever gotten to see <laughs> by Butler. And then these next two are also nonfictions that really have interested me. I've seen them around the internet. They are short and they're kind of more like activist nonfiction. So like, I think at least, or I don't know, but we got Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis. And all I hear reads with Rachel, always shouting about this woman, how she's amazing. She has my name. So like, obviously, <laughs> uh, no, but I, I'm really interested about this one, especially with like, my experiences with family and prisons and things like that. Just to, to be vague, I, I have opinions about this, <laughs> essentially. And then the Red Deal, which is, I think, has to do with climate change and um, the, the Red Nation providing kind of like a pact agenda contract or something about how we can engage with the world in a way that's more sustaining, I think. I've just been hearing a bunch about this. So I don't know. I was just really excited about all those books. The shows were phenomenal. Oh my gosh, five stars in different ways. Like Into the Woods and Six could not be more different. And for those who love Into the Woods, for this revival, they went really minimalistic because it's only gonna be on Broadway for like two months. Originally it was only gonna be on Broadway for like one month. So they it was a really minimalistic set, but with puppetry. And there's a cow in Into the Woods for people who don't know, for Jack and the Beanstalk. Cause Into the Woods is a bunch of grim for fairy tales thrown together into like a blender. And there's a cow. And this cow was puppeteered and it was amazing. <laughs> I think I've never rooted for the cow more in a production of Into the Woods. It was amazing. It was a very self-aware production of Into the Woods. Like it was a production that knew that the people seeing this knew Into the Woods a little bit. And like, and it was, I mean, it, it was a stellar cast and the delivery was like spot on, great time. And then six was just a treat. Oh my God, the energy, so good. Ah, so I had a great time. I had a great time in New York. I got to see Bethany and Jocelyn and obviously we talked about books <laughs> and we, you know, had brunch together. It was super fun. So it was a good week. And when you're seeing this, I think tomorrow I'm going to be in a car driving to Ohio. But tonight there's going to be a live show for the new release of Thon on Kristen's channel. I believe it's Kristen's channel. So you can come hang out over there. I believe it's at 7 p.m. I think that's all the housekeeping I have. Thanks for everyone who came to the live show for Alloy of Law, by the way. It was my first time doing like a book discussion live show and it was really fun. I really enjoyed the conversation. It was just a great time hanging out with people, which is exactly what I wanted this read along to be. So yeah, great vibes. But that's it for this one. If you want to leave an emoji, um, leave. Oh gosh, I'm just looking at all my books. Sword, a sword for Oleander Sword. There we go. I found the emoji. <laughs> and like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.